Hello and welcome to Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany at Utah State University. This is lecture 18 where we'll attempt to answer the question, what are brachiopods and why are they so well studied in paleontology? So brachiopods are benthic marine animals uh, enclosed in two shells and they feed by drawing water into the shell and filtering off food particles. They resemble clams, but they're not related to them. They're referred to as lamp shells because their shells kind of look like the old style oil lamps. Now, one of the most important ways to identify and distinguish brachiopods from bivalves, such as clams and oysters, is that brachiopods have a symmetry around the medial plane. So if you draw a line down their shell, it splits the shell into equal mirrored halves. All right, for example, let's take a look at this shell here. Um, what do you think? Do you think this is a brachiopod, or do you think it's a bivalve like a clam? Well, we could do the simple thing. We can draw a line down the center of it and see if it splits the shell into equal mirrored parts. And it does. So we know that this is a brachiopod. All right, now take a look at this shell. Um, what do you think? Do you think this is a brachiopod or do you think it's a bivalve? Well, it's a little hard to draw a straight line through this to split it evenly. So there's no real symmetry. So we know that this is actually a bivalve. And so that's the major way of telling the difference between brachiopods and bivalves such as clams and oysters. Now this symmetry has to do with the way in which the shell grows. And we'll look at how brachiopods grow later on in this lecture. Let's now talk about the anatomical terms we use to describe the anatomy of brachiopods. The first feature is the pedicle. This is the fleshy stalk that attaches to the brachiopod to the seafloor. Now, not all brachiopods have a pedicle. Um, some are free laying, and some have a broad hinge line instead. The umbo is the raised protuberance on the shell, which is the initial growth stage of the shell. The commissure is the line where the two halves of the shell meet. Now, the two shells are actually attached via a cardinal process. The cardinal process is named because it kind of resembles a heart. This process fits into uh, two hinges that are paired and have teeth that kind of connect in with the cardinal process. Now, brachiopods have three sets of muscles, and these muscles work together to provide movement of the shell. Now, these muscles can be seen in muscle scars in both of the shells. The first one we'll look at is the adjuster muscle. This is a muscle group that move the pedicle stalks. They run from the pedicle side of the shell up through the pedicle, and attached to that fleshy stock. Now the adjuster is referring to the fact that these muscles adjust the position of the brachiopod by flexing that muscle. The next muscle scar is the adductor muscles. These are found on both halves of the shell. The adductor muscles constrict and they actually pull the two halves of the shell together. Hence they're called adductor muscles since they add or bring together the two shells. The final set of muscles are the diadductor muscles, which connect one shell with the cardinal process. When it flexes, it actually closes the shell. What is remarkable about brachiopods is that with these three sets of muscles, they can both open and close their shells by constricting their muscles. This is very different from what is found in clams and other bivalves, which have only one set of muscles, and when relaxed, they open. Hence, if you do a clam bake, the clams will open when the clam is cooked and as these muscles relax. In brachiopods, the resting, resting condition is a closed shell. And this means that muscles are constricted to open the shell. So if you were to do a brachiopod bake, the brachiopods would likely stay closed until you force them open. Now, few people, very few people, eat brachiopods. And when they do, they actually eat the fleshy stalks instead. And these different styles of tongs nicely illustrate the functional difference between the two groups. 
So the tongues over here that you need to press on to open indicate brachiopod. So muscles are for both opening and closing the shell, whereas bivalves only have a muscle that contracts and closes the shell. All right, so now let's look at the uh, rest of the internal anatomy of brachiopods, the other bits and parts that are inside of these guys. To reference the position of an animal without a head or a tail, we have to use some anatomical names or come up with some anatomical ways of describing the position of these shells. So the smaller of the shells is the brachial or dorsal valve, and we usually position these as the upper part of the valve. The lower one that contains the pedicle in those brachiopods that have pedicles, we refer to as the ventral valve. This is the larger of the two shells. The posterior end is the end with the stock, and the anterior end is the end with the commissure. Inside the brachiopod is a large lophophore. Now this lophophore opens up and is used to filter food out of the water. The lophophore is similar to what we saw in bryozoans. In fact, here is a larval brachiopod. Now look at this larval brachiopod and realize how close it resembles the zooid bryozoans with its large lophophore and its small paired calcite shells. Now interestingly, however, brachiopods have a fossil record that actually predate the bryozoans and are known from the Cambrian. Phylogenetically, brachiopods and bryozoans are closely related. And although more recent molecular phylogenies have sort of separated them out a little bit, mostly by inserting some of these uh, groups that don't fossilize very well. But brachiopods and bryozoans are pretty much in the same branch of the, of the tree. Now the lophophore is supported by a calcite brachiodum, which is like an internal skeletal support for the lophophore. Now the brachiodum rarely fossilized, but it can be found inside some fossil shells. Although most often it's not preserved because of its very delicate nature. In shells, it tends to be this interesting like loop-like uh, feature that often preserves in modern brachiopods when you clean them up, especially all that fleshy part of the lophophore. In some brachiopods, like Spinorifia, the lophophore is reinforced with a calcareous support, which more often is preserved actually, especially in these very delicate specimens that are prepared using acid. So pretty incredible to see this skeleton around the lophophore. The lophophore functions to get food into the mouth and is analogous to the hands of the brachiopod. Um, I'm a brachiopod, I'm gonna eat with my lophophore. Brachiopods also have an organ called an ephedrum or kidney that helps regulate water and waste. The final organs in the interior of the shell are the gonads. These are the gamete cells that produce the sperm and eggs. There are boy and girl brachiopods, but some brachiopods are also hermaphroditic and produce both sperm and eggs. All right, so let's go over the muscles again since they're part of the interior anatomy. So the adductor muscles close the shell, running between the two shells. The diductor muscles open the shells, running from the ventral part of the shell up to the process, the cardinal process. And the adjustor muscle moves the pedicle, so it runs from the ventral shell up to the pedicle or the stock to help move and adjust its position. One other term that's unique to brachiopods is strotrophic. This refers to the hinge being in a straight line. Strotrophic brachiopods are common in the late Paleozoic in having a straight hinge line. The one below is a non-strotrophic shell as an example of how different these hinge lines can be. Another term is a zigzag commissure. With this, there's two sides of the shells are growing and they grow in a sort of zigzag pattern to fit together. All right, so now let's take a look at how brachiopods grow their actual shells. There are three layers associated with shell growth. The outer layer, the first layer to be secreted by the cells are the periosteum, which is composed of protein. Now since it's organic carbon, it tends not to be preserved in the fossil record. The next layer is the primary layer, which is composed of calcite. Now this is laid down on the outer margin of the shell. And as the shell grows, a second layer 
of calcite then is laid down. And this actually thickens the shell further. An important point is that brachiopods don't secrete aragonite. Now, aragonite is found in bivalves, and it's the mineral that forms pearls. So brachiopods don't form pearls. The most common living brachiopod is lingia, which is found in abundance in offshore cooler waters. It tends to favor deeper waters. Now, lingia is a living fossil because it has an extensive fossil record that extends all the way back to the Paleozoic. It lives in the mud, and it uses its fleshy stalk to retract into burrows and into the mud. And it's commonly found as a fossil. OK, now let's look at the classification of brachiopods and recognize the three major groups. The first group is the subphylum Linguinia forma, known from the late Cambrian to the recent, and this includes Lingia. The second group is the subphylum Craniforma, from the late Cambrian to recent. These are unusual forms in that they lack teeth and sockets, so they don't have the hinges, and they lack pedicles. They're often found open, like in this fossil. And the most diverse group is the subphylum Renicnella forma, from the late Cambrian to recent. It's a very diverse group. There's five different classes, many different orders. Um, I'll just highlight one group, and that's the bizarre order Pro Producta. Now, Producta is a really weird brachiopod. It has actually forms reefs. It's a reef-forming organism. And it has a shell that opens and closes, but it grows into these like weird tube-like shells. Very different ventral and dorsal shell anatomy. They're known from the lower Devonian to the upper Permian. Because of their large diversity and really good fossil preservation and abundance of brachiopods, they're very useful for biostratigraphy. All three groups extend to the recent. However, during the late Paleozoic, brachiopods were much more diverse. The end Permian extinction, shown here in red with a red line, it really pruned back the brachiopod tree with a number of branches, um, just a few, surviving till today. Because they're so common, they're really great index fossils for the Paleozoic air. Brachiopods are useful for reconstructing marine environments and paleo communities because there are a wide range of substrate preferences. Diversity patterns and ecological recoveries can be studied using brachiopods because their habitats and niches can be resolved in the fossil record. Hence, the study of brachiopods is really important in paleontology and geology in general because of their common occurrence and their usefulness in biostratigraphy and aging rocks and reconstructing the marine environment. Thank you so much for watching this lecture. If you're interested in taking a geology course at Utah State University, uh, check out our website at geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in who I am and you want to check out my website, log on to benjamin.burger.org. Thanks for watching another paleontology lecture. Take care.